supposedly she planned on joining him but she was sick that day luckily for her as far as like Frederick Douglass he tried to get Frederick Douglass to also physically join him as well Frederick Douglass declined he felt like it was a little you know fairly planned he, he thought it was a little suicidal you know what I mean it wouldn't have been, been a good mood or whatever but he was at Frederick Douglass's house at this time as this was going on now I think also by this time by 1859 as far as Harriet Tubman is concerned I believe she had made it or penetrated the underground railroad at least 19 times at least made 19 different journeys to free african americans now as far as the description of her it is also mentioned that sometimes she'll get a little radical but people will be because people will be hesitant to leave out of fear of being killed or whatnot so sometimes she'll take out a gun and then she'll threaten the lives and i think that's also true i don't think that's an exaggeration either only because like for harper like okay Harper's Ferry, for example. Okay, it's October 16th when he finally, you know, executed his plan. He had 22 men with him. He had five black, five black men in total. One was a fugitive, which I think is a uh, danger, danger filled new by. But just really quick, like, uh, by the time uh, John Brown and them makes it to, like, Harper's Fit, like after the shootout and all that type of stuff had started, it was, uh, well, actually, before the shootout, like when he was rounding up slaves and all this type of stuff, they countered a lot of resistance from black people that was, uh, kind of like unexpected. Like a lot of the black people there in the town did not want to help them. In fact, the first person that got killed was a black guy. His name was Haywood Shepherd, right? He got shot twice in the back. And so when thinking about this, it made sense. It's like because you, you're thinking about the consequences. Now, I don't think this like, this somewhat plays to Harper Williams's point <coughs> as far as like the majority of black slaves and people, blacks back then, period, being benign, even though he had a lot of negative uh, descriptions outside of that, too. I'll go into that on the second chapter. But, uh, you know, they also fear like the consequences of getting caught. If you got caught, that's a guaranteed death penalty. So it's like, just imagine, like, you, 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 somebody running up in where you're at, and they got guns and all this, and they tell you, you come on, walk with them, they're going to liberate you. Now, these are white guys for the most part, some of them black. But you already know, living in that time period, once you leave with them, that's pretty much a death sentence. You're not going to be able to say they forced me to leave with them. You know, if you get caught, you're going to get hung. You know what I'm saying? Or you're going to get wounded badly. So that's, well, I thought somebody was behind me. So that's something to keep it in mind also. So I do think it's true that she had to physically threaten a lot of people to keep moving or whatnot because the journey was pretty long in the first place. From from this furthest point all the way up into Canada, it was about 82, 89,000 miles. You know what I'm saying? And I walked 40 miles in my life before it took a whole day. So I could just imagine stopping at different points or whatnot but you still got that fright at any moment you can get caught but you got to make a fucking you got to make a 82,000 mile journey or whatnot even if it's just 40,000 miles if you already somewhat ahead like you in Pennsylvania somewhere or something and you're going from Pennsylvania to Canada to northern Canada so you're a lot closer you still got fucking thousands of miles to go so I could just imagine that <coughs> but anyway so Harvest Ferry, Ferry Ray, I'm going to go into that. October 16th, there's 22 men. One, a white guy's name was uh, Aaron Stevens. As far as the black guys, one, uh, Danger, Danger Phil knew by, I think he was the fugitive because he also, because he had a, a, a wife or somebody that had wrote him a letter that was found on him after he died or whatnot. And it was dated to October 16th. And it was from a lady named Harriet uh, Nubai. And she was basically, you know, keeping them up to date on what was going on with her. She felt like a little uncomfortable where she was at. Like a lot of the mis like a lot of the, <coughs> uh, a lot of the fellow women were picking and stuff like that. And she felt like she might get sold into slavery at any moment she was basically telling him to rescue her or at least buy her freedom or whatnot 
So that was in parts his reason for joining this raid, but he was one Dangerfield knew by another person. His name was Osborne uh, Perry Anderson. Another person, his name was Shields Green. Then another person, his name was John Anthony Copeland Jr. Then one more person, his name was Lewis Sheridan Leary. So all of these people, right? This was at nighttime, actually. A little bit, this is this is around 1:30 a.m. They supposedly had cut the bridges off and the what was it? The bridges and the rivers off. Harpers Ferry was not that big of a town. It was only like 3,000 people there or whatnot. But they cut the bridges off, and the first train that that arrived later around damn I forget what time I think around this time or whatever it was a train that came from a place called Willing and it was supposed to be had it was supposed to stop there and then go to Baltimore from there John Brown's man basically intercepted the train but it like the way they described it's kind of confusing as far as like the order event of events but it was a black guy black guy named Haywood Shepard that worked there and he was a porter the name of the railroad was called B and O Railroad. And uh, when the train pulled in, I, it's 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 kind of fuzzy the way they explained it, but basically, you know, he he, they said he walked back toward the he walked to to the railroad and the bridge, and that's when he encountered a couple of John Brown's men. Whatever happened, he turned around, he started running off, and they shot him twice in the back. He got up, he ran back toward the railroad office, but he ended up dying later on. So he was the first uh, victim or whatever. Now, it was a side note attached to this where they were saying basically like, uh, historically speaking, there's still a uh, the debate going on whether or not, you know, he's considered like a, a patriot, a patriot that pretty much gave his life and refused to join these rebels or whatnot. You know what I'm saying? I think it's also a statue erected of this guy as well. So anyway, uh, as they took over the the, 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 the the railroad station, they held off held up the train for about five hours before allowing it to go to Boston. I mean Baltimore, where you know United States found out what was going on, and that's when they dispatched Robert E. Lee and a company of Marines there. But before all of that happened, just before that. Uh, <coughs> Try not to make sure make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Before all that happened, uh they basically went throughout the town, you know, saying gathering up hostages. I know one of the first places they went to was a guy named John Allstott. And they went to his house or whatever, kidnapped him and his son, and they had about three hostages. No, they had about seven. I think they had about seven hostages. Actually, they were second. The first people that they kidnapped was uh, uh, George Washington's great-grandson, a guy by the name of Lewis Washington. Him, about three of his slaves, and then they, that's when they went to this guy John Allstott's house because he also owned a tavern. It was basically a home and a tavern or whatnot. So they, you know, gathered him up as well. His son, his son, his son name was uh, John Thomas. They gathered him up. <coughs> the person who was in charge of these men, his name was Sam Cook, that actually kidnapped these people. So when they gathered them up, they also had about seven slaves with them, making it a total of 10 slaves so far. By the time they gathered up various people throughout the town, they all took them to uh, Harper's Ferry. By this point, I mean not Harper's Ferry, but like the armory or whatever. By this point, John Brown had already seized the armory and that was like the main location whatever where they was taking all these hostages they had about at least 60 hostages in total by this point and then like you know as word spread around the town you know the people kind of gathered in the mobs or whatever and they decided to attack back so they started shooting at john brown and his men so a shootout happened a, a shootout happened <coughs> uh they all ran the armory left out of the armory building and then they went to the fire engine uh, building or whatever because it was the doors and the walls 
was made out of oak wood. So they shielded themselves along with the hostages in there. So in the midst of this shootout, based on the chapter, they had enough time to, you know, once they had already kind of occupied the armory, which was the main objective, they could have left, but for whatever reason, they kind of like prolonged everything. So as far as like the, the local population, they gave them enough time to kind of get organized to fight back against these people. So that's what ended up happening. Plus the uh, disappointment as far as them thinking that they was going to be able to build upon their 22 men with these slaves and hostages who refused to join them or were scared to join them. So as this shootout was going on and they kind of like trapped inside the fire engine house, that's when you got to consider the train that finally had made it and reached Baltimore or whatever. And then Robert E. Lee and these Marines being dispatched. So John Brown and his man, and thus his sons, also is being held down. So in the midst of them trying to leave, they decided to try to call like a truce with the local population that was shooting at them. So his son, uh, Watson Brown, and then somebody else came out. Now, I believe this other person that, you know, is referenced is Dangerfield Nubai. It's cold out here. Dangerfield Nubai. <clears throat> because Dangerfield Nubai is supposedly the first person that got killed. You know, aside from Haywood Shepard, of course. As far as like John Brown's man, he was supposed to be the first that got killed. Which is kind of weird because they describe him as getting his throat sliced ear to ear with a pike. But, uh, Watson Brown came out and he got shot. Him and another guy. This is how they described it. Another guy that came out with him got shot. They never said Danger, danger Phil knew by. But they did say like the second brother, John Brown's other son his name was Oliver he came out and he tried to pull his brother Watson back and he ended up getting shot mortally too so he died but again as far as like the second guy that got shot along with uh Watson Brown he never said who he was but based on Dangerfield Nubai supposedly being the first person to kill he would have to have to been killed simultaneously to that guy as far as his throat getting split I don't know how the hell that happened you know what I'm saying if it happened from one of the townspeople once you know, Brown and them re-shielded, re-gathered themselves inside the fire engine or whatever after the first two victims. <coughs> after the first two victims, or three victims or whatnot. So by the time Robert E. Lee and them made it to uh, Harpers Ferry, they surrounded, they further surrounded John Brown and his men. And uh, Robert E. Lee sent a guy by the name of his lieutenant, his, uh, a lieutenant. <coughs> James Lieutenant uh, Ewell Brown Stewart. John Brown resisted. He denied, you know, his uh, offer to give in or whatnot. And then that's when they decided to raid the compound. So Robert E. Lee ordered another guy named Israel Green to raid the compound. And that's exactly what they did. They burst through the door, said John Brown fell. And the guy tried to stab him with the pike that he had. But luckily, whatever type of, uh, uh, what you call that, signature, like whatever type of buttons or whatever that he may have had on his outfit saved his life or whatever. Unless the pike itself was too dull. This is what they was talking about in the chapter. But anyway, they all, <coughs> they all got caught. Only about five of his men had uh, escaped. He lost about 10 of his men in total. Now, as far as like a uh, danger Phil knew by going back to his, his wife that wrote that letter, she had ended up getting sold in slavery in the first place or whatever. But again, that's why I, just, I also want to read, you know, note this, why I think it's kind of weird the way he died. Like I say, he was supposedly the first person to get killed. I can understand that. But as far as his throat getting slit, you know, by the time they had rushed into the place, the fire engine house, as far as uh, Lieutenant Israel Green, you know, Watson Brown and Olivia Brown and the other guy they never named had already been killed. So I don't know how the fuck his throat got slit. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if, like, w once they got killed by the townspeople at first, somebody got a little extra happy and slit his throat. Or they talking about, like, when they finally got raided and he was probably just still dead right there in front of the building or whatnot. whatnot and them raiding the compound, they still slit his throat. I don't know how that happened, but he was supposedly the first person that got killed. Anyway, so John Brown got caught. <coughs> they uh they sent him to Charleston or whatever. 
he had when he got caught he got visited by the governor of Virginia at the time his name was Henry Wise now this is crazy like Henry Wise you know because because John Brown was also conventionally being referred to as crazy about everybody else as well but this guy Henry Wise said that anybody that thinks John Brown was crazy was a madman. Like he was the way he described him, he gave him a little compliment, but he basically said he just got a good head he had he had a good head on his shoulders, like he was completely conscious of what he was doing or whatnot. So as far as like uh the trial that took place, uh what's his name? Ralph Waldo Emerson. Because it was, it was actually it was more than him. It was a whole bunch of other people at this trial. At least six hundred people. In fact, you know the guy that killed Abraham Lincoln his, himself, John Wilkes Booth, he was at this trial. But uh, the people that witnessed this trial, okay, another guy named Henry David Thurrell. He had wrote something called a plea for Captain John Brown. Even though he started that off at he started it was it, it's kind of like a Harriet Beecher Stowe, almost. You know what I mean? How like she started off with a series of essays and she put it in book format. It's kind of similar to that. Like the guy was just giving speeches about John Brown supporting him while he was locked up because he gave just as far as Henry David uh, Thurrell is concerned. You know, another guy, another person that was at the courtroom and witnessed John Brown getting killed. But as far as like, I mean, witnessed this uh. Not the courtroom, but, you know, was there at the execution on December 2nd and witnessed him being killed. That's what I meant to say about John Wilkes Booth. Hopefully I did say that correctly. But, uh, yeah, that guy, he had wrote, like, while John Brown was locked up on the 30th, you know, two weeks afterwards, that's when he had gave a speech in Concord, Massachusetts. You know what I mean? And then this same speech he kind of translated into written format later on and he called it a plea for Captain John Brown. You know what I mean? Or it was put in a different type of document, but these this speech this speech that he gave was put in written format later on. Now as far as like uh Henry Wise, like I say, he said he had a good head on his shoulders. He didn't seem like he was a madman. Anybody else that thought he was a madman would be crazy, which is weird because uh Henry Wise went to fight for the Confederates later on. Uh who else? Like I say, Ralph Ralph Emerson you know, he, he has some pretty nice words to say about him. He's basically calling him like a, a a man that was woke while everybody else was pretty much zombies. As far as John Brown's own words, during court, he stood up and he was pretty much unapologetic. He said like he never meant to really start. He, he's basically saying like he felt like he was fighting for the right cause for humanity and that slavery was wrong and God is going to punish everybody. And before, And if you look at it historically, before God you know, sets his wrath down upon people. They are always mad first. You know what I'm saying? Uh, going against the point, in other words. And he said those people exhibited exhibited that as well. Uh, he said he did not regret his actions. And to long story short, if uh, he has to suffer, that's fine. But the question of slavery cannot be swept under the rug. That it is, it is something that's inevitably going to have to be dealt with that was his words and some people felt like his words are so beautiful like uh ralph i think it was ralph emerson for example felt like his words was just as good as lincoln's words later on at the gettysburg address or uh, whatnot uh his wife she went to visit him a day before he you know was executed because during the trial he was complaining about not having enough time to really defend himself in the first place so december 2nd he got killed. Now, as far as like Abraham Lincoln, he spoke on this as well <coughs> when he decided to run for president. And he spoke on this in February of 1860 at Cooper's Union. He was invited to speak there. He took it. He took the opportunity to give his political position on slavery, as well as uh, John. Uh, the, the events that took place with John Brown, because remember, he was the most popular person in the country at the time. He said he felt like, you know, his 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 actions did not really reflect good uh, sense, that they were misguided, etc. And as far as his position on slavery, he restated that uh, he didn't want to 
emancipate slavery where it exists, but he felt like it should not be expanded. And then he gave his racial views once again. As far as uh, Frederick Douglass, he, because I'm trying to hurry up and get through this now, because I'm almost almost at an hour. As far as Frederick Douglass, he uh, published his opinions in The Liberator, saying like the time for like peaceful protests is dead, that you have to partake in an action now. Almost basically what Malcolm X used to say, like, you got to speak a certain language that the enemy understands. But even before uh, Frederick Douglass published his piece in The Liberator, it was another guy. <coughs> they mentioned that somebody had, they didn't give the name of this person, but they was basically denouncing uh, John Brown's actions as, uh, as basically as taking the wrong route or whatnot you know what I'm saying so it was that that that, that particular commentary was balanced out by Frederick Douglass okay and then speeding this up so basically uh, Abraham Lincoln was running against uh, a guy named William C Seawall at the time no C word at the time and this guy was a little bit more radical on slavery. He actually wanted to emancipate slaves. Like the way that history is conventionally described, how they say Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, that would have been this other guy had he had taken Lincoln's place and won the election. His name was William Sewall. He did not. He ended up becoming a secretary of state, though, under Abraham Lincoln. So Abraham Lincoln won win the election. To make a long story short, uh... South Carolina becomes the first state to secede from the Union. They did that December 20th. Uh, about two months later, the February the 18th, you know, these southern states got together. They met and they decided to elect Jefferson Davis as the head of the, as the, head of, uh, the, 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 the southern confederation of states. Mississippi... Uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, no, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, etc. All these states ended up succeeding following South Carolina weeks later. Uh, let me see. As far as like on the 26th, actually, six days after South Carolina succeeded, uh, Rod, uh, Major Robert Anderson was sent to Fort mall tree in the uh charleston harbor or whatnot he eventually had reassigned himself that's what actually what happened yeah he was he was assigned to that fort fort mall tree but on the 26th he chose to you know occupy fort sumter because he felt like it was a little bit more defensible and they still were surrounded by confederate troops at that time as well that was a pretty notable move because he also had owned slaves himself, but he showed his uh, support for the Union, his loyalty to the Union or whatnot. That pissed off the Confederate states who did not want him to occupy Fort Sumter. And some of them had offered that if he reoccupied Fort Maltree, they'll even pay for the expenses, but he had... But he was steadfast or whatnot. So it was found out that on the Jan what was it, January the 9th, of 1960. Now, as far as the president of the United States at the time, it was a guy named Jan James Buchanan. He was the president from 1857 up until 1861. So he was still the president, even though Abraham Lincoln had won. So he had sent reinforcements to assist Major Robert Anderson. The ship was called Star of the West. They pulled up the knife of uh, January, and then something is shot at the ship. You know what I'm saying? And his ship sailed off. Anderson and them decided not to shoot back. He was kind of nervous of uh, kind of like initiating the war between the, the North and the South. Then like, what was it? The 20th is when, yeah, the, the 18th actually of February is when, you know, the Confederate States got a little bit more organized and they decided to consolidate date themselves and also named as Vice President of the Confederate States, Alexander Stephens. A month after that, Abraham Lincoln gave his inaugural address. They gave him a warning or whatnot. Uh, on the 13th, they still occupied Fort Sumter. And the Confederates sent the warning to uh, Major Robert Anderson 
telling them that they now it was actually on the 11th of april he had told them that they got like until four o'clock the very next morning four o'clock a.m to evacuate or be shot at and they left a little bit after four o'clock they were still there the confederates decided to shoot at the fort in which they did anderson and them uh hesitated shooting back for about three hours and they finally started shooting back at seven o'clock a.m the fighting lasted for about two days and then the uh uh major anderson basically and another guy has his, his, his uh shit i forget i forget it i think it was the lieutenant but his name was uh Double Day, Abner Double Day. He's also responsible for inventing the game of baseball too. But anyway, as far as both of them, they decided to uh call it quits and evacuate the fort. And the Confederates were nice enough to let them give a fifty gun salute. So by the thirteenth they evacuated the fort. That's pretty much the end of the chapter leading into the Battle of Gettysburg that took place in July of uh that 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 same year or whatnot now this this the thing right <clears throat> i'm gonna step inside the house now hello like i said this is unorthodox but as long as i get this out because my phone at 59 minutes so it's gonna give me at least 10 more minutes hopefully even if it cut off and i want to get this over with uh, you know what i mean and not make it too long but uh as far as uh uh going back to harper ferry because like i say that's i'm not harper ferry but harper williams so like i say that's pretty much the end of the book now as far as him i wanted to touch on this whole brute thing the civilization thing because uh as I'm fairly reading his words, I'm like, okay, I know about too many different societies. Like, I can understand it. Like, okay, first off, let me put it like this. The universal thing, right, about slavery. I can understand where he's coming from with it, but my thing is, he loses, he loses being objective, in my opinion, when he makes that, the claim of, you know, Africans being uh, natural or, like, natural brutes. And if you take them outside <coughs> of a captivity, any type of captivity, that they'll, you, they'll exhibit that. You know, like their existence will be much harsher based on their own merit themselves and not just an external source or force because this is naturally who they are. That just didn't make no sense to me because I'm like... It, 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 Okay, I'm thinking to myself, like, the knowledge that I know about, <coughs> like, the African civilizations. First off, a long time ago, I read about uh, this guy named Vasco da Gama, right? That was, like, almost two years ago, I think, or whatnot. But, <coughs> whatnot, but what I remember <coughs> is 1499, when he sailed past East Africa, he sailed past uh, Somalia or whatnot. Uh, what's the city name Mogadishu or whatever but within the city it was an empire that existed at the time called the Ajuran or Ajuran Empire and it's spelled A-J-U-R-A-N or whatnot they existed for at least 400 years so they were pretty much contemporaries with the Malians only thing is they was on the eastern side of the map as far as Africa so they lasted from the 7th century to uh no nah, no nah, the tw the 13th century all the way up into the 17th century so 400 years now as far as that year in particular 1499 uh they didn't name the diarist but you can google this as far as a witness a person that was making this expedition with vasco da gama going past somalia they were able to see how the city looked as they sailed past it and they were saying like it was in the center, it was it was a lot of buildings, tall buildings, that were like uh, four to five stories high, and in the center of the city was a whole bunch of different palaces, and then around these palaces, 
were a whole bunch of different mosques. You know what I mean? Like they were saying, the city didn't look that bad or whatever. Now, to me, that seemed to be a pronounced civilization as well that also lasted 400 years. It wasn't just like a, a, a pastoral community 